Then we have the risk for biological systems, that is uh, uh, terrestrial ecosystem, marine ecosystem, and wildfire. And then the, the last, uh, that are the systems which are uh, the most related with, uh, with human activities, that are the food production, livelihoods, health, and or economics. Of course, all these risks are linked together. For example, if a, a lake shrinks because of uh, increase of temperature, then the marine ecosystem will be, will be destroyed in part, and also the, the food production for people who live near the lake will, uh, will decrease, of course. We live in Europe, so I wanted to, to show you uh, um, a bit about the risks for Europe. And you may see that, for example, increased water restriction is one of the risks. But to understand uh, what does those bar means, we have to look at the, to the right. And you see uh, that the first bar represents the present level of risk. Then we have uh, near-term risks, so uh, 20 years from now. And then, as uh, you saw from uh, previous uh, Matteo slides, uh, there are uh, now there are considered two possible scenarios with two degrees of increase of temperature and four degrees from 80 years from now. So you see that the risk increases uh, with time. Uh, now I just want to show you a bit about uh, what is the situation all over the world. I know that there are, it's a bit dense, there are a lot of uh, information here, but I want you to, to see the key points. And um, for example, you see that there is the symbol of the drop almost everywhere. And that means that the water resources are uh, at risk almost everywhere. So you, you already know, I think, that the fresh water is only 3% of the total water worldwide. So uh, the water is becoming uh, a, an important resource year by year, is, uh, is getting uh, more important. Also, you, you may see the, the symbol of the food production in, uh, in Africa, in uh, South America and uh, also in Asia, yes. And you see how much high is the risk. Um, you see that it's already, um, uh, in, in, in Africa it's already a, a, a issue, an issue, the food production, but it's becoming worse and worse. Yeah, what I forgot to mention is the meaning of the struck bar, maybe you, you read it before. The struck bar is uh, what we could do. Uh, so. If, for example, we, we continue our uh, behavior like present day, the risk uh, is the highest. But if we adopt the, the best possible uh, behavior according to IPCC prediction, uh, we could reduce the risk to, the, to this level. So uh, you see that there is a, a good margin of, uh, uh, to reduce the risks. But uh, it's not so it's not so easy, and uh, uh, it requires a lot of uh, uh, efforts. Also, the last thing maybe uh, I wanted to you to uh, to see uh, a link to with uh, what Peter said. For example, the the ecosystem of the ocean. Uh, uh, we told you that the ocean are getting um, acid, and uh, you see that. That's what, what's happening with the, for the um, uh, ecosystem of the ocean, and you see that the bar, the strike bar is uh, zero. That means that now, for at least the next 80 years, we can do nothing to prevent uh, the effect of acidification sorry, of the ocean on the, on the system, and as consequence, as consequence the, the effect that uh, this uh, depletion of the marine ecosystem have on, uh, on humans. Because you see that also that the uh, the red um, the red symbols are almost everywhere also. So all these risks has an, have an effect on uh, on human activity. So I leave the word on Nagran. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Polo. Hello, I'm Nagran. Now, uh, Paolo has uh, spoken about uh, the risks of the climate change and now I am going to speak about how to adapt and reduce this uh, risk and uh, 
this adaptation from uh, from IPCC uh, they define as the potential uh, to reduce adaptation as a potential to reduce the adverse effect of climate change and produce the ancillary benefits but also they mentioned that it cannot prevent all damages this is what uh, they, they, they say as Paulo said that in the oceans for next 80 years you can't just uh, do any change or uh, be, uh, uh, by ad adaptation and uh, mitigation and next is uh, there are numerous adaptation of uh, options also they just give us and uh, more rapid climate changes would pose great challenges to these adaptations and the next great thing is that by lowering the greenhouse gas concentration we can make adaptation challenge an easier one and uh, with re reference to uh, Boyce's uh, slides of energy, agriculture, and transport. Uh, I just give an example with agriculture sector. This agriculture sector alone contributes around 24% of uh, all the greenhouse gases emission done by anthropogenic activity. And in this 24%, the 50% of the global methane emissions are from uh, uh, entrantic uh, fermentation and rice paddies. And 70% of global uh, N2O nitrous oxide emissions are from uh, artificial fertilizers which we use. And 5% of global uh, carbon dioxide emissions are from uh, fossil fuel consumption and biomass burning. Uh, the next important thing uh, uh, with respect to this change is that uh, we can uh, control a solid way. I'm sorry, uh, the solid waste and wastewater disposal. This is the major challenge for all developing and uh, underdeveloped countries where uh, you see in uh, 2010 the emissions of uh, emissions of uh, uh, methane was about uh, 50 to 80 megatons and uh, this may this is mainly due to uh, not <coughs> improper or uh, there is no proper uh, way, ways to uh, dispose this waste and uh, these methane emissions are uh, due to this anaerobic, anaerobic uh, digestion of this uh, organic material and next step what what we are going to see in our presentation is about mitigation uh, mitigation refers to any anthropogenic intervention that can either reduce the source of greenhouse gas emissions or enhance their sins uh, the mitigation assessment is an international level uh, analysis of uh, various technologies and practices uh, that have the capacity to reduce the climate change and for which we have to take into account the time frame of uh, various uh, uh, things uh, the, uh, the main uh, things are like first is the building building sector where uh, for, uh, for a particular if you take consider an example of any building it's like almost 45 to 45 plus years a building can last and also when you go for hydro or a nuclear a nuclear plant can work for 30 to 60 years and uh, this rate of technology change is closely related to the lifetime of the capital stock and now i give, uh, give the floor to laundry and uh, he will speak about uh, the con reasons for this uh, So, uh, so thanks to Paolo, uh, now you know better know the, the risk and so I want to deal uh, with it and to do it uh, I want to introduce you uh, the reason for concern uh, so uh, it is um, the element of uh, classification uh, frameworks created by the PCC uh, a few years ago and uh, the main goal is to facilitate our judgment about uh, what level of uh, climate change may be dangerous by aggregating uh, different concepts, so impact, risk, and vulnerability. So another uh, purpose is to, um, uh, to, to, to evaluate the relationship between uh, the impact uh, from climate change and uh, the increase in the global mean temperature, which is uh, an indicator, and there's uh, two more indicators. Uh, so we can focus on, on the graph. So you can see um, there's a, a shelf scale, uh, so you are the five reasons for concern, I will give you more detail just after. So thanks to the, scale, uh, the shelf scale, uh, you can read uh, the level of additional risk due to climate change, so from undetectable to very high in a, in, a in a bubble. So it is linked with the global mean temperature, uh, you can read on this scale, 
But the two more indicators, which are uh, the cumulative CO2 emission and uh, the change in uh, the greenhouse gas emission, uh, so here. So uh, let's have uh, so you have the, the three uh, three main scenario for the future, as uh, Matteo explained. Um, let's take a, uh, an example, for example, for the first reason for concern, which is a unique and certain system. If we take um, a global mean temperature change about three degrees, we will have a very high risk, which is connected to the cumulative contributing CO2 emission about uh, between four and five thousand uh, gigatons of CO2, and it will deal with uh, no change in the greenhouse gas emission. So now I want to uh, give you more detail about the five reasons for concern for the first, which is a unique and uh, certain system. So in fact, a uh, unique system are, um, are realistic to, um, uh, to a job. Um, uh, unique system can be uh, physical, like um, uh, glacier, or biological, like coral reef, or um, human, um, like uh, Uh, yes, like uh, indigenous communities, sorry. And uh, now about the, the next uh, reason for concern, which is uh, extreme weather events. So it's about uh, the, the frequency and the magnitude of, uh, of climate change, which may increase uh, with uh, global mean temperature. Uh, we can mention uh, heat, uh, heat precipitation or heat uh, waves. Uh, the next, which is about uh, the distribution of, uh, of impact, uh, so, in fact, in some region or, or, or country, um, they will uh, meet uh, greater um, uh, significant losses than uh, other regions, so they deal with it. Um, the next, which is about uh, the global uh, aggregate uh, impact, um, so it's related to the overall economic and uh, ecological implications uh, in the climate change, and it's about how climate change will impact the the, the, the world economy. Um, and uh, the last, which is about uh, large scale scale events. Um, so, with the climate change, uh, some um, physical and ecological systems are at risk of abrupt or irreversible changes. And in fact, it's about how um, will the impact from climate change um, make our adaptive, adaptive capacity uh, not in us uh, anymore. So, uh, now I want to, to give you uh, the observation from the, the LICE IPCC report. So we can focus on uh, the first indicator, which is uh, uh, so the global mean temperature change and the five uh, reasons for concern. So about uh, the first reason for concern, which is a unique and uh, sweetened uh, system. So um, we know that there are already system at risk for climate change with high confidence. And we know that with uh, a few increase of uh, the temperature, um, the, the severity will increase and uh, because of uh, limit uh, adaptive uh, capacity. And um, above two degrees, uh, the risk will increase again and we will have a very high risk. Um, and I think this uh, reason for concern is very important because it is uh, the most advanced uh, reason for concern if you compare with, uh, with the other. Um, about the second reason for concern, so the extreme weather event. Um, so obviously the, the frequency and the magnitude uh, will increase uh, with the temperature, but what we can say is that um, with a small increase, uh, so, uh, we can say that a small increase of temperature uh, will be enough to, to, to see a large increase of, uh, of uh, extreme weather events. So in fact, uh, this uh, reason for concern is really sensitive to a small increase of temperature. So only one, to one degree will be uh, enough. Um, Next, about the distribution of uh, impact. So, in fact, people from developing countries will um, um, will meet a greater risk uh, than people from developing countries, and there is a, there are a lot of expansion uh, uh, for this, such as the dependence on the climate for the um, for the agriculture sector, or the climate for for the agriculture sector, which is uh, um, often the, the main resources. Uh, uh, of the country, and we know that uh, with the global mean temperature change, we, uh, uh, the yield crop will, uh, will decrease. And in fact, it deals with the uh, higher vulnerability for country, uh, for developing country. And again, we deal with a figure about uh, two, two degrees. 
Uh, next about the Gigat impact, so it's not the easiest uh, reason for concern to explain, but nevertheless, I, the IPCC report told us that um, at between 1 and 2 uh, degrees, uh, the risks are moderate and uh, there will not a significant uh, change, in, for example, in the gross domestic product or, or in uh, biodiversity. But around 3 degrees, uh, the risks um, become high with a high confidence and uh, we know that uh, it will deal with bio biodiversity losses or ecosystem goods and services uh, losses. And uh, above 3 degrees, um, we are not really able to estimate uh, the damage because uh, it's not uh, only a science. Um, and about uh, the last um, uh, reason for concern, which is a large-scale singular event, so we know so we are speaking about systems which are um, uh, which are at risk of irreversible uh, changes. And between uh, zero and uh, one degrees, uh, the risks are moderate, but we know that uh, there are already uh, systems in uh, irreversible uh, shift. And um, above three degrees, uh, the, the risks are high. And IPCC uh, told us that uh, the, uh, the sea level rise uh, from high sheet will be uh, irreversible. So just to, to finish, um, I think uh, the, the IPCC report um, make a good tool by uh, using the reason for concern in order to, to help people to know uh, what may be uh, considering that uh, dangerous uh, climate change. And I think it will help people uh, to know that adaptation and mitigation are essential. So now I will let uh, Renuka speak uh, Thank you, Nandri. So, uh, hi, I'm Renuka. As we have um, discussed with my colleagues and when he defined what is adaptation and mitigation, I will be talking um, about the pathways which we can use for adaptation and mitigation scenarios. Well, as my colleague defined already, that these two scenarios are complementary to each other. Both of them are, can help us reduce the risk of climate change. Uh, we can see that mitigation, um, on one hand, uh, can uh, work on the global level and its effects can only be noticeable after a few decades. While adapt, uh, adapting adaptation policies, we can work on uh, local and regional level and can reap the benefits with immediate effects. But both these adaptation and mitigation pathways have their lim common limitations. For example, we have limited financial resources. We have limited human resources. Also, sometimes there is uncoordination from government on international scale as well. And we have insufficient tools to monitor all these effects uh, which can happen if we adapt to all these scenarios. Uh, where are we today with adaptation and mitigation? With these two complex... Uh, With these two complementary approaches, um, they, uh, today they are uh, in a very big contrast towards the development um, of a nation or of um, uh, on the global perspective. Where we want to be is we want to have these two scenarios complementing each other, yet uh, acting towards the progress and development in order to reduce the climate change risk and also to have a, a low, low carbon development scenario. Uh, with adaptation and mitigation pathways going hand in hand, we can have co-benefits um, uh, all, from all these scenarios such as improved energy, ef energy efficient systems, cleaner energy sources. We can re reduce the consumption of water and energy um, or power sector in urban areas through greening the cities, recycling of water, etc. We can have susta sustainable agricultural development using effective uh, techniques we can have a protection of, of ecosystem. Um, well, how can we um, implement the adaptation scenarios? First of all, my colleagues talked about different sectors. Um, for example, here I give a, um, some, diff, uh, some adaptation pathways which we can use. Uh, for example, for water consumption, we can have rainwater har harvesting system 
there are systems for desalination of water which will help us uh, uh, also to um, uh, conserve our water resources. In agricultural sector, we can um, introduce variety of crop uh, by uh, having effective soil management techniques and also con by controlling soil erosion. Uh, for infrastructure um, and tourism industry, uh, well, there is one example of um, marshland creations to buffer against the uh, rise of sea level. We can have diversification in the tourism sector. Uh, for health, we are in uh, very much need of improved sanitation and emergency service uh, services. Uh, for transport, we see in our daily life that we can have better transport and uh, efficient um, uh, planning of roadways and drainage system and for energy sector we have to have um, a very efficient distribution of power system. Um, for mitigation pathways, well mitigation um, is a very strong scenario which can actually limit the global warming below 2 degrees C. It has a potential but, um, well I guess it's too late. Um, but so in order to do that, this, we require substantial amount of reduction of carbon dioxide and GHG gas emissions. Uh, if we start from today, we need to make it absolutely to zero level. Um, my colleagues will talk more about mitigation scenarios, but I can give you some examples. For um, uh, industry sector, what we need to do is not just control the emissions of CO2, but also other non-CO2 emission gas which contribute to global warming. In infrastructure uh, sectors, or let's say the buildings, we can have efficient light lighting system in order to uh, use more of our renewable resources. Um, this is a very important um, factor for mitigation is the energy sector. Uh, what we need to do is to switch our fueling system from coal to other renewable resources such as uh, solar and hydro and also to nuclear power. So using all these scenarios, uh, what IPCC uh, group does is they uh, develop four separate models uh, which are known as representative concentration pathways uh, which, uh, which take into account the radi radiative forcing. So these models are depending on different uh, scenarios for adaptation and mitigation which take into account different socio-economic situations and emissions and also um, Glo um, global level climate and atmospheric conditions and thus with this feedback and uh, parallel system they um, develop separate models for uh, uh, concentration. Uh, from these RCP scenarios as we have seen we have um, projections of over a century for carbon dioxide emission. The last scenario with IPC, uh, RPC 8 8.5, where which takes into account no adaptation or mitigation scenario, we see that the carbon dioxide em emissions reach to a very high value, and this is the lowest RCP 2.6 scenarios where um, we can see the uh, carbon dioxide emission rise up to 2030, and thereafter they start to uh, decline. So, in order to um, have lower emissions. We need to have adaptation policies and mitigation policies starting from right now, not just from, uh, it, it should be from individual level to government level and also on the international level because there is no other planet B. And with this last remark, I hand over the stage to uh, Adnan. Thank you. Thank you, Vedika. Uh, good afternoon, this is Adnan. Uh, let's have a look on the mitigation scenario. Well, uh, this is a scenario that Blaja said earlier, we have probably gone through it and you have got your, your convinced answer, I think, the equivalent or something like that. So, if you consider the, from the pre-industrial level, from 1950 to 2000, uh, the carbon dioxide emission uh, will get like 1% per year. But if you consider the last 10 years, uh, last 10 years means from 2000 to 2010, you'll get is uh, increase like 2.2 percent and who are the responsible countries for this uh, globally you are uh, the app is approaching higher to higher carbon dioxide emission and uh, basically the OECD which is organization of the economical cooperation and development headquarter in Paris 
Uh, these countries are four, 34 countries, uh, most of them basically they are de developed countries. They have consumed a less amount in the last 10 years, if you see. But if you see the Asian countries like uh, China, India, or Indonesia, and uh, some like Brazil and other side, so those are really getting higher to higher. Because they have a, uh, a pledge or uh, some Cancun or Copenhagen uh, conditions, like they have to make less carbon dioxide uh, decrease or something like that. So they have taken a policy like two degree target, which is which means like you have to make a two degree, uh, you can rise up to two degree of your pre-industrial uh, level. So this is how the two degree like look like. So here is the graph of the uh, blue line. Uh, blue line is the limit of like uh, 55 giga gigatons equivalent carbon dioxide emissions per year and this is uh, the policy has been taken into account like okay you have seen uh, the countries of Asia has been given a chance uh, or other who are really producing much more carbon dioxide uh, up to 2030 that you can have your emissions as uh, USA or Europe has uh, produced much more in the earlier stage, so they have given a just uh, uh, a chance to other people to develop. So, okay, the reference year is 2030, and up to that we are assuming like we can have 2% of increase of carbon dioxide. And then, uh, after two, uh, 2030, you have to decrease like 3% of the total carbon dioxide emissions. And somehow, if we make or produce like 55 gigatons equivalent carbon dioxide per year, you have to pay a high price for it. In case of three, minus 3%, three like 3% decrease, you have to make 6% decrease. Like, that's quite impossible indeed. It's like double. And if you start like uh, from, you start later, like 2050, you have to pay double price, the cost will be much more, that means almost double if you start in 2030. So the earlier you start your integration process, the better it is. And I have seen probably from the earlier speaker about the RCP 2.6, and this is uh, roughly uh, follow this, this line. And finally, in, in the last, we hope to have two, per, uh, two degrees centigrade. So how this mitigation cost will be managed by the countries or how it will affect our economy or the globally. So it is predicted like, okay, the models or something like you have, you can have questions later on. Uh, this is a speculations and you know the market is not stable all the time. It has some policy and it's changed each and every time. So uh, it's assumed that with a model uh, called Integrated Assessment Modeling, IASAM, uh, that in 2030, we are predicted like one to 4% GDP loss, and 2050, it is two to 6% GDP loss globally. And it may vary country to country, as you know, different country has a different uh, organizational, capabilities, the economic, economic levels or something else. So, but if you consider uh, like, uh, okay, it is higher, but if you look on the annual growth rate, uh, it is, the reduction is just uh, less than 0.12% in both cases. So it will, I think it will not, uh, it's say like it will not uh, vary that much or it's okay. So who will be at this cost for the mitigation? Well, uh, it is say like the developing countries who are now developing, uh, and they will have to pay the price for it, most of it. Uh, but OECD countries who are developed now, they have the responsibility to make the world better. So they will put their hands together for uh, helping those countries like to uh, uh, make a cooperation. So they have taken an account like uh, 100 billion uh, US dollar per year and it has to be raised like by 2020, it has to be like, 
but not directly. They will give this money to the developing countries for the mitigation of the environmental changes, or the climate factors, like uh, through their technological support, to, uh, through the aids or something like that. So I think it would be better uh, to make the world a uh, greener one and less warmed. Uh, and what else? Uh, this, like there is a speculation. Like uh, finally, uh, if you, uh, if less percentage of people, like most, like if you have seventy percent of people think about this two degrees or global warming decrease or something like that, uh, finally it, it will not work out. There is a speculation like that. We have to have ninety percent, like ninety plus percent, people have to be aware or work together to make. Uh, this two degree target. And I think uh, that's all from my corner. Thank you very much. I'd like to give the floor to Selim for make a link between energy and uh, this climate stuff. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Sid Weber. I will be talking about uh, some technology options uh, and some realism how we can do uh, make this thing work. IPCC Working Group 3, uh, Subcommittee for Mitigation, uh, so it's a separate report for that, um, collected 900 scenarios um, and uh, concerning multiple pathways, how to reach uh, um, or how to commence mitigation. We will focus on the two um, degree maximum uh, warming as this is the scenario, though now unrealistic unfortunately, uh, which will prevent the major damage. And this two degrees uh, maximum uh, climate change, um, temperature change, average temperature change on the world uh, in the next uh, around to the ne end of the next century, early uh, century, um, means that we have around 450 ppm CO2 equivalent uh, concentration to reach. So there are a wide range of technological, social, economic, and institutional trajectories uh, talked about in these 900 scenarios. And the most uh, realistic one uh, include uh, or deal with this problem here. We have seen this uh, graph before. The majority of the increase as well as the absolute value of the CO2 equivalent emissions come from fossil fuel usage and industrial processes. So, for what do we use these fossil fuels? Here we see different regions, same situation, 2017, 2090, uh, uh, 1970, 1990, and 2010. So, the world is growing. We are 7.5 billion people and we will be 9.5 if no war happens in 2050, there's a lot of people and they want to improve their lives and they're doing that. Where do they improve their lives or where do they improve their lives the most in the last years? Asia. We talked about China. China lifted 300 million people out of poverty within 20 years. This is huge. And what happened? <laughs> The electricity and heat supply and demand, of course, basically went off the roof. There is one exception, exceptional region, or group of countries, where did this this not happen. This is the so-called economies and transition. Do you know what that is? Soviet Union and their dependent states. That is economic collapse. And of course, CO2 emissions collapse. So we have the one trajectory, more poverty. Sure. Do we want that? No. So we have to think about what we can do else. 
Here is 25% electricity direct emissions. Together um, with other uh, energy, it becomes roughly 35% we save that. There are other emissions groups also, like industry, transport, and the agricultural sector. The electricity, all of them are important, and all of them are dealt with in the report. The most important one we will be dealing with is the electricity heat production because it's centralized. We can do something about it. Transport, mid-term to long-term. Industry, mid-term to long-term. Changing boilers, changing technologies, changing chemical industries. Transport, cars. Electric cars, very expensive. Perhaps they will be one day running around, but not now. We can change the electricity production, so we'll be focusing on that. And in fact, that is what the IPCC also focuses on. I've uh, put some uh, selected technologies. This is not the entire graph because it will be too long and too, uh, too much information. This is basically what we have today. Coal, a lot of emissions. This is, by the way, the emissions uh, uh, line roughly <coughs> In this value, 430 to 530 ppm CO2 equivalent. To reach that, we have to make sure that we do not surpass, on average, this line. Problem is, coal is very CO2 incentive, uh, intensive, and it's very cheap. So, as you can see, these are uh, the, these uh, lines here, these medium values, I will take these ones because there is of course a certain uncertainty depending on technology, where we are, geography, uh, which countries, uh, technology used, etc, etc. So the median value for coal at uh, uh, high full load hours, which is the normal because these are base load power plants, are, uh, quite, is quite low to get, uh, compared to, let's say, gas. And this is a combined cycle plant which is reach approximately 55 to 60 percent efficiency while coal only releases like 40 normally. So what we can do about it? The IPCC is uh, very much focusing on scenarios um, called the CCS, Carbon Capture and Storage. And it says that if CCS technology would not be used or cannot be used, is not mature enough then costs will go up very, very high to reach or to still be in this range. And it lists a number of uh, technologies and pathways to use uh, together with CCS or in case CCS is not available widely uh, to use instead. Which are they? Wind, solar and nuclear. All of those have very little emissions compared, specific emissions compared to the carbon intensive emissions. If you look at costs, wind is very good. Nuclear is also quite good. Solar is not that quite good, might come down, but it has physical limitations. All of these three have physical limitations. There are a lot of uh, other technologies listed, but all of them have a very limited, uh, or more or less limited, um, potential. Let's say um, hydroelectric power is the best. It can base load, it is super uh, effective, like 90, 95% of energy conversion. Problem is, in plain vanilla countries, you don't have hydropower. You need mountains for that. Same goes for concentrated solar, solar and all of these are very geographically bounded um, technologies. So basically, we'll be focusing on this one, wind onshore and offshore. I'll just put one for the sake of uh, clarity and nuclear. And before I finish, I will talk about uh, two things. Wind is intermittent. That means, though the potential for wind and basically also solar is quite big, there's one big unsolved issue, storage. And storage, even if you have the technology, will make things more expensive, largely more expensive. 
nuclear has its shortcomings also. How many nuclear reactors can you build, even if you forget about septums, waste, and safety? There is a limit to that also. And the most important conclusion from the IPCC mitigation report is that we have to look at every technology without any ideological filter. Thank you very much. Now is the time for uh, questions, remarks, complaints. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Celine. So, uh, I know uh, some brave members of the audience have lectures in, uh, let's say, 20 minutes. So we have just time for questions. Uh, maybe we can uh, orient these questions, these comments, towards uh, COP21, which was uh, a bit discussed uh, in this part, but maybe not enough. So, feel free to orient this debate as you wish. I do have one question to um, bad effects like smelting or permafrost soil and so on. Is it considered as a, a risk or is it taken into account for the yeah for the equations or for the yeah yeah for the calculation of the thing in the next hundred years? What kind of Yeah, like the melting of the permafrost soil in like Russia. Yeah, it's uh, with the consider it a risk in the sense that um, it, it's happening, of, of course, as uh, uh, many other uh, things like hurricanes and other things. But yeah, it's a bit uh, particular in the sense that for sure it, it's happening, you know, the the permafrost uh, melting and uh, and and it. But uh, for risks, uh, I mean, they mean not the the melting itself, but the the problem that. Uh, that, that this physical um, this physical phenomenon lead to so risk in the sense not of the phenomenon itself but uh, uh, what are the problem that uh, it lead to so as like the hurricane for example if I tell you the hurricane uh, it become more and more but they, they become more in the desert where there's nothing there's nobody this is not a risk. Uh, in, the, in this sense, the, the permafrost is a risk for what he, it leads to. So, in this case, it's, it's a risk because of um, what it could uh, do to, for example, polar, polar bears or other uh, ecosystem that we are not sure of what will happen, but there's a certain risk that bad things will happen. I hope I, I answered your question. Yeah, maybe I can add something. Um, there is a strange thing about the, the scenario 8.5 because if you discuss with geologists then they tell you about peak oil, coal, uh, yeah, peak oil, peak for gas and peak for coal also. And what you come up when you discuss with them is that there is not enough fossil fuels to be extracted to produce this kind of curve. This is just not enough. So it's just an exercise. You see, it doesn't have the same value as the other curves, which are more realistic. This one is just some kind of exercise, and maybe it takes into account the, um, the melting of the permafrost. But it's not set, really. It's just a curve. But it's very interesting to see that, that they are, there's not enough to produce all that, that, that CO2. Um, by the way, talking about uh, CO2 uh, emissions, um, I just like, because we have uh, often talked about the plus, uh, plus two degrees objective, uh, just maybe if you can add some words about this objective, is it uh, realistic or not, and what should be targeted? Uh, because I've read a very, inter very interesting papers from yours in uh, a Well, yes, actually, if you, I mean, very rapidly, uh, maybe you can refer, you can give a reference. But there are two conditions for the for the 
two degree uh, uh, scenario. One condition is that we are able to stabilize our, emo uh, our emissions, not emotions. Emotions can grow, but emissions should stop right now and then decrease. And then there's a global curb, um, carbon budget, which is 1,000, globally, roughly 1,000 gigatons of CO2 from now to infinity. And it's very simple to show that you cannot fulfill both conditions, so we are above this two degree. So, so it's, just a, it's just a number which came out in Copenhagen, and since it's the only international reference Everybody talks about that number. The other number that was given in Copenhagen is this 100 giga uh, dollar per year for adaptation. But these two degrees doesn't come from, from the IPCC. It's just a number which was given you know, in Copenhagen. But it doesn't have any precise uh, scientific meaning. And, and we are above. We are on a trajectory which is roughly three degrees. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or yep. comments? Uh, I, I know I agree with what Jacques said, but if you look into the detailed scenarios to obtain this uh, 2.6 uh, radiation power or, or two degrees, it's about the same. There is a very important uh, use of carbon capture and storage to a point which I think is not realistic. So in that sense, I would agree with what you just said. But it goes to, I, I, I've looked in 2100, the amount of carbon dioxide which has to be stored is at least 15 15,000 gigaton, no, 15 gigaton per year, up to 50 gigatons. And we know about how to do it for 1 million. So this is the, the, the challenge. So if we think we are not really able to do that, then the two degrees will be completely overshoot, except if we start really doing many, many nuclear reactors. And that means, I, when I say many, many, it means up to 16,000 uh, one uh, gigawatt in, in 2019. Yeah, you're right. So IPCC uh, statements may seem uh, scary, actually. There are even more because, as they have said, they've made uh, the basic assumption of, it's not easy, but generalized, carbon storage, and that's a, that's a good point that Hervé and Céline in his talk uh, showed. Maybe? Okay. In the, in the last, uh, the last thing you say is uh, a concern of nuclear power. You say that you do need a, a huge number of uh, nuclear reactors. But uh, that uh, that choice uh, didn't uh, does this uh, choice uh, take into account the fact that we have no uh, no no uranium for uh, such a, a long uh, time scale and such uh, uh, an amount of reactors. Uh, if I may answer to that, um, this is not true. <laughs> Yeah. This is no. This is not true for two reasons. Hmm? Uh, first of all, the uranium reserves, as published in the Red Book of the IAEA, uh, refer to certain prices. If the price goes up, then more reserves become resources. So this is the first thing. Second thing, we uh, use only uranium 235 in our thermal reactors, and honestly, I am really not a friend of this water reactor technology. It is just an established technology can use it now. All other things need to be developed. It probably will be available in 15 years. It depends on how, how much money actually is put in. Because the basic technology is in the science is demonstrated. The commercialization though really of course needs some uh, R&D. 
Um, at this point, I would like to show you something else in another graph. Um, But it's a good question anyway, right? So, yeah. <coughs> so, we only talked about electricity, right? And you today think nuclear can only be used for electricity. This is far from the truth. So, it's a matter of technology. We use a thermal reactor, thermalized neutrons, and you can only use uranium-235 and the red plutonium to a certain extent. And we have an exit temperature about 300 degrees. Generation 4 reactors, and you can Google that up, you don't have a lot of time to do that, uh, will be able to use the entire uranium and plus the thorium, which is four times more abundant than uranium, which makes about a thousand, a dozen of thousands years of resources. But we have to use fast reactors and breeding. And there are, of course, issues attached to that, but the basic science is demonstrated. You have Phoenix, Super Phoenix, Japan has Maju. Uh, Russia is operating Belyarsk 600 and just started to operate in Belyarsk 800, which is a fast reactor using uranium and plutonium. And basically, you can burn all your waste. This is the nice thing. All the waste issues. 95% of it is fuel. It's fuel. But not for a thermal reactor, for a fast reactor. And the second thing is, if you go up with your exit temperature and use a different coolant, for example, liquid sodium, liquid lead, molten salts, helium, that's a helium one, uh, compressed helium, of course, very under 92 bars, then you can reach very high temperatures. What you can do that with that, can, what you can do that with that is you can uh, produce hydrogen at a very low price. And with hydrogen, you can either directly use it, I am not advocating that, by the way, but there is a big fan community of that in the scientific and technical community, or, and, or, you can produce all of the fuels, all of the plastics, everything we can, uh, we do actually produce from oil, you can produce with a cheap, high temperature energy source. And nuclear can do that. It is possible. We need to put more uh, development effort. <coughs> Another point is, even if you only use it for electricity generation, you will get like twice as much as electricity for the same fuel. So it's a matter of technology. At the moment, we only have the water technology. In 10, 15 years, we will have the sodium-cooled reactor. In 30, 40 years, we will have the high-temperature reactors. Some say, and I'm not that optimistic anymore, that we can accelerate this process. It's a matter of politics, because nuclear is politically caged. There is a lot of oppo uh, opposition to that, for various reasons, historically, and some other reasons, which are less obvious. But technologically, nuclear can deliver. Oh, thank you, Selim. Just in a cup, I get some applause. Uh, just to complete and maybe just to maybe mitigate, if I, if I could say, it's just on the, the nice slide you show, the, the waste heat recovery problem is not specific to nuclear. It means, of course, nuclear energy may help, but it's only one solution among lots of others. And uh, the, for, exam for example, for instance, the waste heat recovery uh, mechanism that can be used. So, of course, it's a plural uh, answer to this problem. And when I uh, talk about a huge number of nuclear reactors, it was in an extreme scenario where CCS was zero and no carbon storage was possible. So it was kind of an you know, extreme scenario. We have to explore all the all the range. Okay. Um, for five minutes left, maybe some questions more specific to COP twenty one. 
also, it seems like everybody <laughs> does not care about this ever, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, what, what I'd like in, uh, I think it's one, one of uh, Renuka's slides, is something very, oops, something very discreet. Oh my God. It's reverse, okay. Um, it's the quoted, quoted we. And uh, it's like uh, we didn't uh, talk very much about what could be our personal uh, action against climate change. Maybe we can follow uh, Nicolas Hulot's uh, advice for the layman, which is eat less meat. Which is a, a bit simplified, it's like two hours of this conference uh, summed up in three words. And he's right, maybe he's a uh, nutritionist will, will agree uh, too, but um, uh, I think it's because of what Nagadan showed on uh, uh, the fact that um, uh, the breathing uh, costs a lot of uh, CO2, releases a lot of CO2, and then after cows uh, emits uh, TH4 uh, watching trains pass by. Uh, but uh, you see it's difficult to, to, to guess what could be our personal uh, initiatives, and that's why uh, uh, COP21 is important, because it's uh, actually um, up to the countries to, to find answers. And I think it's very difficult for them to, to agree on such uh, mitigation policies because it's a bit like uh, the, um, the meeting of 200 co-owners of the same building and some have garage and some have top floor uh, apartments and they won't be agree on the, on the things to, to make so it's complicated but still if, if there are more precise questions on Specified question on COP21? Yeah. Uh, one thing which is not discussed is uh, how will be the situation, the number of population of human beings in 2100? Is that uh, 10 giga habitants? Uh, inhabitants or 15? Just, a, just a, a very, a very uh, simple multiplication. If all each inhabitant uh, consumes about uh, three, uh, three uh, ton of equivalent petrol, that makes thirty. That, that makes uh, thirty uh, gigaton of petrol per year, and this is a, a question of energy. It's not, it's not anymore a question of gas emission question of energy, and so we have to think about that too. Uh, yes, I would like to add two remarks. Um, this young lady there <laughs> pointed to the fact that um, mitigation is a global problem for uh, everybody. Actually, it's not for 200 countries. If you take 15, 15 most important emitters, if they agree to reduce, then we're in business. You know, it's not a question of 200. It's just 10 up to 15. They have to decide that they want to, to decrease the emission, and that's it, because they emit 70% of, of, of what is emitted. So, so that's one point. The second, but the, the, the point I wanted to raise is that adaptation is local. It's not global, because the effects are different in different places. And um, and there, you uh, you meet the limitation of the uh, of the uh, of the modelization of the climate because with one point each 50 kilometers or each 100 kilometer, you cannot predict what is going to happen uh, regionally or on a regional scale. So we have to combine what climatologists are able to calculate with what local people know about where they live. Otherwise, you will not have proper uh, politics. And I would just to uh, uh, finish with one remark about Syria, what is going on right now. If you type Syria climate and uh, draft in the, in the journal Nature, you know, the, the, the journal Nature, scientific journal Nature, 
you find some studies which show that the drop, there was a draft which started in 2006, 2007 for three years. It's a common feature of the local area, but it was more serious than before, and some people advocate that the, the fact that it's more severe is due to climate change. And now the, in a region like this where it's uh, on the verge of, you know, between arid region and desert, this is very fragile. It's, a, it's, a, it's something which is very fragile. And during the three years, there was an increase of urban population by 50% in eight years because of these three years drought. 50%. If you add on that, 1.5 million people who left Iraq and went to Syria, 1.5 million over 20 million living in Syria, it's as if you have 20 million in Europe, you know, coming within a few years. And so it's a kind of destabilization which mixes various things, climate, politics, uh, and, and uh, so this is one of the difficulties of the problem because if, you know, we discuss climate, if it's just a climate effect, that would be simple. But it's not just a climate effect, but then it mixes with all, our, all other problems. And the destabilization of it, 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 it increases the destabilization process of these states around, you know. And then it takes some other colors like, you know, ideology, religion, and so on. But uh, so this is part of the difficulty of adaptation. Because if you have this kind of, you know, destabilization of, of the states, then if a state is not able to feed its own population, then, then it's, you know, it's chaos. And chaos is not just a local chaos, but you see that it has effect throughout the world. So economics do really matter. You know, I will show you on what the world really, really, really goes. <laughs> no, this is not a joke, they laugh of course, but this is why we kill, why we bomb, why we do everything we do. It symbolizes life and economics matter. We will only solve these issues if we can have solutions which make economically sense, which will provide jobs which are not too expensive, which do not cause economic collapse. Thank you.